Okay. Um, today, we of course are talking about stewardship of faith and commitment. Those two things are almost the flip sides of the same coin, and we'll talk about that when we get into it. Um, I want to em emphasize no class next week. Not on not this class on Thursday, not the philosophical theology on Friday. Carolyn and I will be in Wisconsin celebrating her dad's 102nd birthday on Friday, so we will be gone. Um, if, um, if anybody shows up, I won't be here. You guys can get together and party if you want, but uh, I won't be here. And then we will come back on the 11th with, oops, with stewardship. These buttons are very close together and they're flat. With stewardship of time and opportunities, then resources, influence, call to action, and the final exam. Okay? Any questions about any of that? And you do remember, we're not meeting next week, <laughs> okay? I have had people show up on weeks that we weren't meeting, so. Um, just to give a little bit of a reprise to re review what we've talked about before, I mean, this class is called Practical Theology because, as we said before, practical and practice, as in putting things into practice, are the same root word. So we're talking about with our Christian faith, how do we apply that to our lives in practical ways? How do we put them into practice? And sort of the theme that I'm using for us to get a handle on that practical theology is the theme of stewardship. Stewardship can be defined as the conducting, supervising, or managing of something, especially the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. A steward is one who cares for something that belongs to somebody else, like the manager of a business that they don't own. Still responsible for running it, taking care of it, making sure that it works, making sure it's successful, but not the owner. We are stewards of God's creation. And so this class, we're talking about how we have responsibility for using the things God has entrusted to us. And that doesn't just mean money and material possessions, which is where everybody's mind always goes when you say stewardship. But everything in our lives, as you know, as we've talked about, call and vision, and today, faith and commitment. Those are things that, that are, are put in our care by God. So how do we use them correctly? How do we honor God by how we are stewards of those things? As Christians, of course, we know all things were made by God. All things still belong to Him. And so we are called to be the caretakers, the, the stewards of everything God has entrusted. Uh, Christian stewardship has to do with every aspect of our lives, every choice we make. So we've been talking about this in terms of whole life stewardship. Jesus has called us to be disciples. That means followers. And as we follow him as disciples, how do we use our lives in a way that's honoring to God? How do we practice whole life discipleship? A very practical um, application of that. So that's what we're talking about. Any questions about all that? As we go along, my, my, my reprise of this stuff will probably get shorter, but it's important we know where we're coming from with it. So, today we want to talk about stewardship of faith. You may never have thought in terms of being a steward of the faith that has been entrusted to you, but let's talk about that uh, for a while. First, what is faith? Those of you in the philosophical theology class will appreciate the fact that faith is probably the ultimate example of an abstract. Concrete is something that exists in, in time and space. An abstract is something that doesn't have a physical existence and yet is real to us. So faith is the ultimate of abstracts. You can't touch it. You can't smell it. You can't see it, although you maybe will see it in practice. You can't see the thing itself, faith. So what is faith? Hebrews 11, 1 to 2 is a definition that is often used in Christianity, and it says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Remember I said you couldn't see it? This is what the ancients were commended for. I'm going to come back to Hebrews 11 a little bit later because Hebrews 11 is called the Hall of Faith, or the Hall of Fame of Faith. Because in that, the writer of Hebrews, the whole chapter is one long litany of various people from, from the Old Testament who demonstrated great faith. And so we'll come back and look at it. But when we, if we want to understand what faith is, we need to understand a little bit about the word that it comes from. Now, um, the, the Greek word that we have translated faith in the New Testament is the word pistis. This word occurs over 240 times in the New Testament. But, in fact, it's so common that there are versions of it in different word forms. What I mean by that is uh, the word pistis is a noun. You know, the thing, faith. 
The word pisteo means, is a verb. It means to have faith. That word is often translated believe in the New Testament. So it's a, but it's a version of the same word that we translate faith. There's an adjective, pistos, which means um, to be faithful. All right? So faith, belief, to believe, to be faithful, all of those, they, they actually talk about the pistis word group because there's so many different versions of this word. And it is so common. As I say, over 240 times in the New Testament, we have this word occurring. And the, the definition, and we can expand on this, but the basic definition of the Greek word is to trust, to have confidence in, to be uh, faithfulness, to be reliable, to assure of something, uh, to be persuaded is another way that this is translated. Um, to have assurance, there's, a, there's an indication in this Greek word of firmness, especially firmness in how things are connected. The connection between people, the connection between propositions, this idea of something reliable and assured, locking things together. Um, related to that, various versions of this word get translated faithfulness, fidelity, loyalty, commitment, trust, belief, proof. You get the idea. It means to trust, to rely on, to be assured of, to have confidence in. And again, it's used as a noun, a verb, an adjective. There's all sorts of different ways in which this is used. Yes? Okay. Would hope go into that same category? The word for hope, I don't believe, is the same root as pistis. Okay. I mean, you, when you talk about to be sure of, yeah. you could you could probably extrapolate the concept of hope. I don't think that word as much is, is used. But here we're talking about, in order to get a good understanding of the word that we translate faith, the scope of what it means, all having to do with assurance, reliance, depending upon trusting in kind of things. Okay. Um, one definition that is in the footnotes of the Jerusalem Bible is that faith is an act of trust and self-abandonment. I actually like that. Self-abandonment. Where we're not, you know, it's not me. I'm not the focus. I'm not the one who's making it possible. The act of trust and self-abandonment by which people no longer rely on their own strength and policies, but commit themselves to the power and guiding word of Jesus Christ in whom they believe. Okay. I think that's a good definition. Yes. I'm really having trouble with that phrase to be pers to be persuaded. Mm -hmm. Does that really belong there? It does because it, to to have faith means um, to to have gone from not being convinced to trusting. There's a, there's an there's a and uh, the verb form of this is an active movement. So to be persuaded um, and the word persuaded we have such a tendency to put negative connotations on things. Um, one of the theses that I wrote in my communication theory in college was that all communication is an effort to persuade. And so when we talk about faith, we're talking about moving from either outright disbelief or um, not being sure to be persuaded to move toward a belief of trust and reliance and assurance and dependence. Okay? And that's one of the ways, that's one of the connotations this word carries. Yes? I mean, it's like that old hymn that I know whom I have believed in and am persuaded that right. he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Right. Okay. Of the Apostle Paul. Very good. So we could talk about this as uh, being a trust in and a commitment to. There's that commitment word. And we're going to see overlapping between faith and commitment. They are, you know, they're like this. They're not exactly the same thing, but they're like this. They really are so tightly connected. Uh, a trust in and commitment to what we have reason to believe is true. Now that reason to believe is true. Well, I'm going to talk about as I go a little bit further along in terms of the, the relationship between what we believe and why we believe it. In philosophy, we've been talking in philosophy class, we've been talking about justified true belief, JTB, it's called, or the tripartite uh, idea of what knowledge is. How do we know? It, it, it affects how we believe and whether that belief is justified. So and you get into knowledge issues there. But ultimately, for us as Christians, obviously faith is a word that's used elsewhere. In fact, the word pistis is used often in Greek philosophy. But for us Christians, faith means to believe in Jesus Christ, that he was God's son, that he died and rose from the dead to save us from our sins. That is, that's the focal point of our faith. And we always have to remember that. 
People can say, oh, yes, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian, I have Christian faith. I don't believe all that stuff about Jesus being raised from the dead or him being divine or anything like that. Well, then, no, you don't have faith. At least you don't have Christian faith. You may have, you may have reassurance or trust in something else, but to Christians, faith means to believe that Jesus was God's Son and that he died and rose from the dead in order to save us from our sins. Um, I shared this recently because it came into my head. Um, but I work for World Vision. There were, uh, you know, World Vision is global. It's one of the biggest nonprofit organizations in the world. World Vision US alone is over a billion dollar organization, and they're Christian. Um, well, I was working with all the other different support entities around the world, and some of the evangelical Christianity is not the dominant form of Christianity in a lot of other countries. And there were people there, I believe, that they, you know, they were Christians, they love Jesus. But they had a much more loose idea about things like evangelism. You know. And one of my dear brothers, who I know he loved Jesus, but he, his culture viewed this differently. We were talking about evangelism projects because we had different kinds of projects. And evangelism was one of the things we did. And he said, well, you know, evangelism can be a lot of things. Um, he was from, um, actually from New Zealand. He said, evangelism can be a lot of things. An evangelism project can be, you know, it can be uh, small animal uh, husbandry. It can be literacy courses. It can be this, it can be that, it can be something else. And I said, Peter, evangelism means bringing people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Which is another way of saying bringing people to faith. Because this is what we have faith in. And he didn't really disagree with me, but he had just over time, you know, in his culture, it has kind of gotten watered down. We have to always, as Christians, remember that our faith is determined by what we have faith in. The Christian faith is different than a lot of other understandings of faith and a lot of other religions, and that the whole focal point of our faith is Jesus died, crucified, died, buried, rose again, coming again to save us from our sins. Okay, that's what our faith is. Now, on the one hand, faith can be seen as meaning our belief, our trust, our reliance on Jesus. Uh, but then beyond that, once that's established, our belief, our trust, our reliance on Jesus, we then have to decide what we do with that. It leads us into questions of loyalty, of faithfulness, of commitment. Once we have that belief, do I just sit back in my chair and walk and say, boy, I'm glad of that. Can't wait till he gets here. You know, can I have a cup of coffee, please? Or we can say that I have a responsibility now to do something with that faith. That I have to demonstrate faithfulness. I have to demonstrate commitment. That's the stewardship part that we're talking about. All right? So let's talk about that a little bit. First, when we talk about what is faith, I think we want to start with what is actually controversial among some Protestants, and that is that faith is a gift of God. Faith is not something we generate. Faith is given to us. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, very popular verse, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is, this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, it's a gift of God. It comes from Him. It's not of works, and by works it means anything you can do yourself, even if that means generating an emotion or generating a, you know, something from inside. Now, some people have argued with this because they say that the reference to what is it that's not of yourself but a gift of God is not the faith part, it's the salvation part. But since, and that may be, I mean, the structure of the sentence can be read that way. But if you say, by grace you've been saved through faith, if it's the salvation that is the free gift of God, but it comes through faith, isn't there a logical connection that the faith is coming from God too? So, the idea that faith is a supernatural gift of grace that comes from God, that is not acquired by human effort. And for the people who argue against that verse, we have Hebrews 12, 2, which talks about fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Author, it comes from him. He creates it. And Jesus also said, of course, asking you will receive, knocking it will be open to you, seeking ye shall find. What is he talking about? He's talking about Faith in Him that leads us to salvation. You can come in, Mike. Yes? Is faith given to all or select, selected by God? Uh, 
Well, the, <laughs> yeah. well that, that question is the question of reform theology versus not. I'm sorry, what is that? Just a note to you. Okay. Okay. I'm going to ask you. Okay. We'll do. Thank you. Um, some Reformed theology, some Reformed theologians would say that the elect are those to whom God gives the offer of faith. And that he doesn't offer to everybody. In fact, um, there, and not just in Reformed theology, there are other theologies that say that Jesus actually didn't die for everybody. He only died for those who were meant to be saved. We're getting into some fairly fine points of theology in there. You know, we, we talked about that some in our systematic theology class. So, you know, if you want to review those. Um, I'm going to get into accepting a faith in a few minutes. So let's touch on that a little bit more. It's a huge issue. I mean, we could spend the next two hours talking about that. Um, and not everybody agrees on it. Okay. Um, but here, let's say, whatever group you feel like is being addressed with this, that, that, that Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. Also, from Romans 12, Paul says, think of yourself with sober judgment. I've abbreviated these because this is the part of it that I, that I think makes the point. Think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. God gives the faith. God distributes the faith differently to each person. Some people are people of great faith, as you know. Some people struggle to get by with their faith. They have difficulty trusting, being assured of, relying on. Okay. So, while some Protestants would say that no, faith is a response to God's call, I believe, and I believe Scripture supports the idea that faith is actually itself a gift from God. That apart from God distributing it, authoring it, providing it, then we do not have access to true faith. Okay? And I'm going to get into that a little bit more in just a minute when I talk about the, the, the role of the Holy Spirit in that. Related to this somewhat is the question, is faith blind? Now, do you know what I mean by that? Is faith blind? Um, Soren Kierkegaard, a, a, a Danish philosopher, brilliant, um, very difficult to understand, but brilliant. He really is the father of existentialism, which is not usually perceived as a Christian philosophy. But Kier the way Kierkegaard did it, it was. In fact, Kierkegaard was, was um, very critical of Danish uh, religious. At that point, by the time of Kierkegaard, they had a state uh, religion. The, the government of the, uh, Denmark supported Lutheranism, and philosophically, they followed G.F.W. Hegel. Um, and I'm not going to get into what that means in this class. But Kierkegaard was was vehemently critical of the church in Denmark in his times, and he addressed it theologically, and he also addressed the problems philosophically because so much of the Lutheran church at that time was based upon a philosophical premise which he didn't feel was Christian. In fact, Kierkegaard was so adamant and so persistent in his criticism of the dominant culture and of the church in that day that nobody liked him. <laughs> um, he made himself a gadfly to the whole culture. And for generations after that, nobody would name their child Soren. I mean, he became quite famous, but nobody liked him. And people would say, I mean, if, the if their child was being grumpy and unpleasant and just, you know, having, you know, they'd say, oh, don't be a Soren. Well, that's where that comes from. Kierkegaard, his insistence that the, that the culture had it wrong in terms of their religious beliefs. And everybody was Lutheran. Everybody perceived themselves as Christian in, in, at that time. Now, one of Kierkegaard's theological premises was that faith in Christ involved a blind leap of faith. That true faith was completely uninformed. That it meant closing your eyes and casting yourself off into the abyss in the assurance that God would catch you. And that there was no rational, cognitive, evidential support for true Christian faith. Um, now, Francis Schaeffer came along a lot later. Okay? Francis Schaeffer was the first half of the 20th century. Um, Schaefer took Kierkegaard's idea and I think gave it the right correction. And Schaefer said that it is a leap of faith, but it is not a blind leap of faith, but an informed leap of faith. And Schaefer uses an analogy. Schaefer says it's as though you, you know, you are uh, 
traveling by ship and your ship wrecks on an iceberg and you're cast, you know, you're cast out onto the iceberg and you're there and you're, it's completely dark. You can't see anything. But you can feel that the shelf of ice that you're standing on is beginning to break apart. And you know you've got to move. You've got to do something, but you can't see anything. Well, Kierkegaard would say, if you believe in, if you have faith in Christ, if you are, in, you know, in God's grace, then just jump off and God will take care of you. Schaefer said that's not really what the Christian faith is about. The Christian faith would be in that situation if the person on the, the shelf of the iceberg heard a voice and the voice said, hello, you can't see me, but I can see you. And I want to tell you, I know that where you are is not stable. But if you move to your left and jump down, there's another shelf that is stable about three feet below you. And if you can get down to that, you'll be fine until the rescue boats get here. That's what he meant by an informed leap of faith. You're still in the dark. You still have to leap. But you now have someone who says, I know what your situation is, and here's what you need to do about it. You still have to decide you're going to do it. You're still going to have to decide. You're going to leap in the dark and, and trust that the person who told you that is only, that, that there's another shelf only three feet away. Now, Schaefer's point was, that's what Scripture does. I mean, his comment was that for Kierkegaard to be right that it is a blind leap of faith, we would have to have no directions from God at all. And yet we have both the written word of God, which gives us instruction, and we have the Holy Spirit that guides and directs us. And so I think Schaeffer's description of faith being an informed leap of faith is a much more accurate one. It still involves a leap of faith as a Christian. You still have to decide that... You know, people may not like me, I may not fit into the culture, this is going to be hard, but I believe it's true. You still have to make that leap. Is that fair? Now, in our day, in, in where, especially if you live in some, most of the states in the South, where I lived, um, it's no big leap of faith to, be, to, you know, to profess Christianity. In fact, if you don't, you're not going to invite, get invited to parties. But still in much of the world, it is a major effort for people to really practice the Christian faith. But I believe that it is informed. I think Schaefer is right. Um, W.H. Griffith Thomas, and this is uh, quoted by Alistair uh, McIntyre, a uh, modern theologian, that, that Griffith Thomas lived, lived at the end of the 19th century. He said, faith is not blind, but is intelligent, and commences with the conviction of the mind based on adequate evidence. And he would say that adequate evidence is both the, the testimony of scripture, and, well, all testimony of Scripture, the testimony of the Holy Spirit to a person's heart, and also the evidence they see in history and in the church. Okay. Other Christians, both historically and right now. Peter Williams, another theologian, says, The classic Christian tradition has always valued rationality. God gave us reason for a reason. Okay. God made us rational creatures. Christian tradition has always valued rationality and does not hold that faith involves a complete abandonment of reason and will in the teeth of evidence. Okay, in other words, we, if all evidence was against this, then the tradition, class, traditional classical Christian understanding is not that we are deciding we believe this against all the evidence, or in the teeth of evidence, as, as William says. Okay? And... John Lennox, who's a Christian apologist in England, says evidence-based faith is the normal concept on which we base our everyday lives. So the idea is that we are not without some <coughs> witness and therefore evidence, like Schaefer's voice on the iceberg. Now, one of my great heroes about the issue of faith being blind is Alvin Plantinga. And how many of you all are in the philosophy class? Um, you've heard me talk about Plantinga a lot. One of the foremost philosophers alive in the world today, of any kind, of any flavor, and yet he is a committed evangelical Christian of the Reformed tradition. He's Dutch. Well, he's American, but he's a Dutch history, a Dutch uh, heritage. Plantinga is professor at um, philosophy at Notre Dame, and he says, I mean, he, he gets into a lot of the noetic, you know, belief structures in the mind and all that kind of stuff, if you get into the philosophy of it. But, for us lay people, he says, 
Christian belief is produced in the believer by the internal instigation of the Holy Spirit, endorsing the teachings of Scripture, which is itself inspired by the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit is faith. Plantica tends to take the middle road here. And that's not because Plantica waffles. Plantica is, you know, brilliant about this. But he says, the people who say it's all a matter of faith, and the people who say, well, it's only based upon what we know is true, he says it starts with the Holy Spirit. Back to the idea that faith is a gift of God. It starts with the Holy Spirit speaking to our heart. And the Holy Spirit, in speaking to our heart, endorses the testimony of Scripture. Verifies the evidence, if you will. And then we have the choice of determining whether we accept that. And in that way, the work of the Holy Spirit is faith. Or you could say, faith is the work of the Holy Spirit. Again, faith is a gift of God. Does that make sense? So he's walking kind of that middle. He, he also talks about the fact that while faith may be the evidence, the result of uh, evidence testifying to the reliability of Scripture or the testimony of the church or whatever, um, it's, all, it's primarily the result of hearing the truth of the gospel with the internal persuasion of the Holy Spirit moving and enabling our hearts. Okay. So again, he says, yes, we do respond to the evidence of Scripture and the evidence of history and the testimony of the church, but the ability to hear that in a way that makes a difference and to choose that is a work of the Holy Spirit. So it's, it's not just up to us. The danger of people who talk about accepting the evidential or the, the evidence for the faith as, as a part of deciding it is that they may lean too heavily on my deciding, my too heavily on my rationality, on what I think, without the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Plantinga draws that, that line correctly, I think, and consistent with what Schaefer would have said. It's still a leap of faith, it's still relying upon what the Spirit has told you, but the Spirit has spoken to you, both through the, Holy, uh, through the Scripture and in testimony of that. Now, one way to kind of sum that up in terms of faith is no one can have true faith unless they're called by the Holy Spirit and taught the truth of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Scripture says it's a kind of folly to those to whom the Holy Spirit has not spoken. It doesn't make sense to people. Okay? We need the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for this to all click for us. But to accept the offer once we've heard it, the new believer must understand in whom and in what they are called to have faith. So there must be understanding. You can't completely exclude my being aware of what I'm believing in. Built on the testimony of Scripture, on the Christian, on the church community, and on the personal experience of the believer, as affirmed by the Holy Spirit. So you see how that process works. The old, the old thing was, since faith is a gift of God, somebody said, "Well, nobody, nobody comes unless God calls them." Actually, Jesus said that, unless the Father calls them. And people say, "Well, yeah, but we have evangelism meetings, and we call people to be saved, and they, they make the decision, they come forward." And I heard a. a a brilliant teacher one time saying, well, everyone who thinks that they are they are coming to God, the first step they take toward Jesus, they realize that he took the first step toward them. Okay? We don't initiate the process. We respond to it. Okay? Any questions about that? Now that, you know, that idea that the Holy Spirit speaks to us and tells us, calls us, if you and no one can be saved without the Holy Spirit's presence. You then get into the question, well, does the Holy Spirit, the question you ask, man, does the Holy Spirit speak to everybody? And denominations differ on that. Some say he does, some say he doesn't. He only speaks to the elect. Right? I'm going to talk a little bit more about that when we get into commitment. But remember the issue of you know, what we're talking about here in terms of practical theology and stewardship is how do we practice this? So far, I've just been talking about what is faith, where does it come from, how do we accept it, right, what's the process. But then, the question I want us to look at is, what are we supposed to do with our faith? Faith is not, should not be a passive thing. True faith changes <clears throat> us. It changes our lives. If it doesn't, you better go back and start asking some questions about it. Right? So what do we do with our faith? I want to give you a number of, number of things here. First, receive it. Faith comes from God, offered to us by the Holy Spirit, but God does not force anyone into His will. Now in this regard, I am not being a very good Reformed theologian. 
Because one of the principles of Reformed theology is irresistible grace. That if you're one of the called and elect, you don't have any choice. But Jesus said, the time has come. He said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Well, now, if the elect were all in, whether they knew it or not, or liked it or not, or whatever, it was irresistible grace, and that people were going to come to the faith anyway, Jesus would not have said that. Okay? We still, God never forces anyone. Now, you know, there can still be an elect. There can still be a group that God has, because Scripture talks about that a lot. Before the creation of the world, He called you for salvation, it says. But still, God never forces anyone to do His will. In that regard, I do not agree with the concept of irresistible grace, that we don't have any, any say in the matter. We still have to choose to accept the faith that is offered to us. Or else Jesus would not have said, repent and believe. Does that make sense? Okay. But still, that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily say there aren't elect. It just says that the elect would have to make it, uh, would have to agree to receive it and accept it and believe it too. Okay? So first thing, the first obligation, as the Holy Spirit speaks to us and offers us faith in Jesus, is we have to receive it, we have to accept it. The second thing we have to do with it is hold on to it. To be sure of. The New Testament is full of passages that say, don't give up. You know, don't, you know, hang on to the promise you've been given. And if you if you hang in there, then you will receive the reward that is promised. I can't, that happens. That's referred to so many times in Scripture, I cannot but believe that it is possible for us to throw our salvation away. Or else, why are all those passages saying, don't do that? That if you want to receive the reward, you've got to stick with it. You've got to hang in there. You've got to hold on to your faith. Yes? Did you just say, we could throw our salvation away? Yes. Now, and I want to make a distinction there. Um... I don't believe there is anything that a believer, or somebody who's really accepted Jesus, can do, can do in terms of a sin or an action or anything else that would cause their faith to be taken from them. All right? You can't lose your salvation. But based on all the passages that talk about don't give up, you know, hang in there, stick with the faith, I believe that while you can't lose your salvation, you can't throw it away. If you... If you consciously renounce Jesus and say, I don't believe in him anymore, I don't accept it, I'm not going that way anymore, then God will allow us to go where we want to go. God doesn't force his will on anybody. But it's not, there's no sin. It's not like if I, you know, if I am in, in, in a moment of slight weakness kill somebody, that I've lost my salvation. The idea of mortal sins, that there is there are sins that that are big enough that they themselves will cause us to be damned is not biblical. Now we may have we may have big consequences for those sins in terms of you know spending the rest of our life in prison or being executed or whatever else it is. You know, if, if the sin is sexual sin, it may be sexually transmitted diseases or illegitimate children or you know broken relationships or whatever else it is. We will we will all, we always have to accept the consequences of our sin. But one of the consequences of sin, if we, you know, when we repent of it and ask for forgiveness, is that God, you know, God does forgive us. There are no sins. If, if there were a category of sin that was too serious for us to be forgiven, then why did Jesus have to do what he did? I mean, couldn't he have just said, you know, be warm and filled and go on your way and you're forgiven? The fact that he had to suffer and be betrayed and hang on a cross and die a horrible death, the scope of the suffering and the scope of the price he paid is to me an indication there is no sin so big that that will not cover it. All right? Yes? I think a lot of people, and me included, know people who say they were Christians and yet something happened, they lost their spouse or something like that, and they turn against God. Right. If God loved me, he wouldn't have done it. I became a Christian and now I'm supposed to be good and look what happened. I lost her, maybe a car accident, I lost all my kids. I mean, you know, they're all very tragic, but we all know people that have just run their hands in yeah. the air and said they get it. And again, the, in the Reformed tradition, they would say that when that happens, that's an indication that person wasn't never, a believer? never really was a believer. They weren't part of the elect, they did not be a real commitment or whatever. Um, this is an issue, historically, 
and we've talked about some of these things in the history classes. Historically, this was a real challenge for the church. In fact, it threatened to split the church back in the late 300s and 400s because during the persecution of some of the Roman emperors in the first three centuries of the church, the persecution and even the threat of persecution was so bad that they were calling upon Christians to renounce their faith. Some of the, some of the emperors thought the reason that Rome was losing its power is because we're not worshiping the old gods anymore. So the, the, our job is to get more people to worship the old gods. So we don't want to just kill Christians. We want to force them to start worshiping the old gods again because then the gods will bless us, you know, the pagan gods will bless us and we'll be great again, okay? So they don't want to just kill them. They wanted to force them to convert. So they tortured, you know, they, all kinds of horrible things. Well, when that happened, a lot of the Christians, um, a lot, held out under threat of torture or even under torture and did not renounce the faith. Many of them, unfortunately, did renounce the faith. Well, once Constantine comes along and Christianity is first acceptable and then later, under Theodosius, becomes the church, uh, the religion of the Roman Empire, the church had a struggle because they said, what do we do with these people that renounce the faith? Because they were all now coming back going, you know, I really didn't want to do that. Uh, I really do believe in Jesus. I want to come back. And, and they said, is it really that easy? Can you renounce Jesus? I mean, it's not like everybody who was threatened with torture or was tortured renounced Jesus. Many of them held up under that torture. Many of them were still alive and maimed because they held up the faith even in the midst of torture. And so the church was saying, what do we do? And some people said, absolutely not. They can't come back. They have renounced the faith. They are lost forever. Others said, yeah, if they just say, you know, I'm really sorry. I, I wish I hadn't done that, but I do believe in Jesus and I want to come back then let them back in. And there was almost a church split, even very early on over that. Finally, the thing they said is, okay, they can come back if they do something to demonstrate that they mean it, that they're serious, that they really are sorrowful for having renounced the faith. And they would require acts of penance. It may be a pilgrimage, it may be, you know, there were all sorts of things that they were required to do. In fact, some of the self-flagellation uh, kind of stuff came up because of some of that. That they had to actually show their remorse by, by hurting themselves. I'm not saying that's right, I'm just saying this historically this was the case. The whole thing that we Protestants, we look at penance today, and, and usually when it's represented on TV or whatever, well, say three Hail Marys and, you know, blah, 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 and you're okay. All right? Um, but the idea was that when that happened, something needed, needed to be done by that person to demonstrate the fact they were sincere and they were really sorrowful that they had renounced the faith in order to let them back in. And you can understand, and that's what, that, that compromise is what kept the church from splitting over that issue. But, um, so today when we have people who, because they have suffered, they renounce the faith, it's not like that's the first time that's happened in the church. This has always been an issue. Um, some, some theologies would say they never really were people of faith. Some theologies would say we need to pray for them, encourage them, be there for them, comfort them, and help them understand that that's not, you know, that it's not true, and that God has patience for those who suffer. Um, somewhere in all of that is the truth. Okay, I can lean toward forbearance and, and patience for that, um, and, but still an insistence that while I'm sorry for all you've suffered, that's not the right answer. You know, you in fact are, are cutting off the only true source of comfort from yourself when you, when you deny the faith because of that. Lynn? When my husband died, I was really angry with God because he had been ill or anything. He just died. And, um, I can remember thinking, God, I really don't like this, and I don't understand why. But it uh, doesn't matter. I can't change it. This is reality. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's a reason, and hindsight will tell me that reason. But here I am four years later, and I met a friend on this street, and I never see her, you know, she's, she's a friend who just sort of pops up in your life periodically. And she said, um, 
two or three of my friends have lost their husbands recently, and I've given them their contact information. I expect to hear from them. So she realized that I had come through you know, the eye of the needle right. and had kept my faith. Therefore, I would be able to offer some sort of insight and reassurance for these terribly confused, mixed up mm -hmm. people who were suffering great loss. Um, so I did thanks for the opportunity, but I still need it. Yeah. Well, and we don't like it. I mean, no, but the, our lives are full of suffering. The world is full of suffering. The reason it's full of suffering is because of humanity's decision uh, to rebel against God, to betray God's faith and trust. That's why sin and suffering and death and grief and all of that exists. You know? So the fact that God comforts us in that, the fact that God was willing to do so much to save us, despite our unworthiness, um, is, is all part of the story. And yet our, our, our quickness to blame God when it wasn't his fault and God has done so much to try to provide, to ameliorate the suffering, try to provide for us. Um, and we, we simply we put our blame in the wrong places. Um, so, so to hold on to our faith, to be sure of it, C.S. Lewis, and by the way, C.S. Lewis wrote a book after his wife, you know, he was a bachelor until his 50s, met Joy Davidman, married her as a political convenience so that she wouldn't be deported from England, and then later they fell in love, real love, and then she died cancer. Um, and he wrote a book called A Grief Observed. It is a powerful book. Don't give it to somebody right if they've lost a loved one. I don't recommend that. Because that's, you know, that's almost as bad as saying, well, fuck up, you know, all things work together for the good of them and love God and call according to his purpose. That does not help. I would recommend, I recommend to Christians they read that before they experience great suffering. Because in it, Lewis is unbelievably honest about his own struggles. And he, he never says, I don't believe there's a God, but his fear is that, that God is not loving. He never doubts that there still is a divine being, but he wonders whether that divine being really cares about us. And he, he works through all that in the book of Grief Observed. Ironically, after he wrote that book and it was published like a year or two later, Somebody gave it to him and said, you know, I read this book and it's spectacular, because he wrote it under a pseudonym. He didn't write it under his own name. Because he was afraid that people who knew him as a Christian, that this would actually hurt them. It would hurt their faith. It would make them question the faith. So he put it under a pseudonym. He ends up in the book coming to back, to back to his firm faith. But he had a woman come up to him and say, you know, knowing you lost your wife a year and a half ago or whatever, there's a book here that you really ought to read. And it was his book. Okay. Um, was she a Christian? Uh, yes, she became a Christian. She was Jewish originally, a, a, a Jewish cynical socialist originally. But she significantly converted. She was from New York too. She converted because of Lewis's writing, which is why she went to England and met him the first time. Because his writings had been so much to her. And then one thing led to Okay, Lewis, in talking about faith, and I really like this, faith is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods. And that really does apply to what we're talking about, because when changing moods makes sounds like it's making light of it, and I don't mean that. But when we suffer a tragedy, or have indigestion, or whatever else it is that, that affects our feelings about things, Lewis's point is that faith is exactly our willingness, our ability, our, our determination to maintain what we believe even when things get dark from whatever source. Um, and Lewis said one time that, you know, there are, some people said, are you always absolutely sure that this is true? And he went, no. He said, there are times when Christianity seems terribly unlikely. But then I remember that before I was a Christian, there were times when Christianity seemed very likely. And he said, I have to remember that sometimes I must attribute these moods to, bad, to a bad breakfast. I mean, there are all sorts of things that can make you feel differently. The issue is, do you hold on to what you believe? Do you hold on to what you, you have accepted and committed yourself to? And to Lewis, that's the definition of faith. And it's consistent. Faith is the confidence in what we hope for, the assurance about things we do not see. Confidence, assurance, holding on, even when 
things aren't going the way we hope they would or expect them to. Okay, let's move. Remember, uh, Lewis called himself the, the most reluctant of Christians. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he, he really fought his faith um, <laughs> before he accepted it as his faith. Yeah, and he accepted it while riding in a motorcycle sidecar. His brother Warney had a motorcycle, and on the way to the zoo, <laughs> on the way to the zoo one day, he was in the sidecar, and he said, "I don't know exactly what happened, but I know when I got in that sidecar, I did not believe Jesus was the Son of God who saved us. And when I got out of that sidecar, I did, <laughs> because he'd been praying, he'd been thinking about it, and asking for guidance and all sorts of things. And his friends, J.R.R. Tolkien and and, uh, and Dyson." had been talking to him about the faith, because they were Christians. And he struggled and struggled and struggled, and he finally said, yes, I, I believe. And led all of everything else, but he, it's a great story. When I got in the sidecar, I didn't believe Jesus was the Son of God. When I got out of it, I did. It's like Garrison Keillor um, was interviewed one time by um, Wittenberg Door. And they said, do you know when you became a Christian? He said, no, I don't. And they went, aha! As though they caught him in something. Because Wittenberg Door is always a parody. It's a parody. Everything's a parody. Or was. And Keeler said, I don't know exactly when I became a, uh, when I, when I became a Christian, but I know when I knew I was a Christian. In other words, he couldn't pick a date or a time, but there was a point in his life when he thought, I didn't believe that. At some point, I decided I didn't believe that. That's... Same thing that Lewis was saying. When I got in the sidecar, I didn't believe. When I got out, I did. Somewhere in that in that period. So, here's a huge Christian. So, what do we do with our faith? Third point. We need to practice it. This is the practical theology part. We need to apply faith in practical ways to all, and I mean all, every aspect of our lives. I said earlier, true faith changes us. True faith cannot be passive. It must lead to a life that is more actively aligned with God's will and with the examples that were given in Jesus. Faith, true faith, leads us to get to know God better and to become more obedient. That's what the whole book of James is pretty much about, is that very theme, that faith has to be a real thing that changes us. In James chapter 2, and I... I Cut some verses out of here, a couple of verses out of here just to uh, make it fit. <laughs> you foolish person, James says to the church, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless, or faith without works is dead, he sometimes says in the King James. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, and not by faith alone. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. James is not saying you get saved by your actions. But he's saying if you have real faith, then it will lead to actions. If it doesn't, there's something wrong. The analogy, which Carolyn's heard me do 2,000 times, at least, at least is because uh, I thought for a, for a long, long, long time, what's a good analogy for this uh, issue of faith and works? And that is that one of the characteristics, I, I saw a documentary on this one time, one of the characteristics of life is movement. All living things move, like self-generated movement, not just because of blowing in the wind. Now, Granted, uh, an oak, a um, redwood tree, you're going to have to stand there a long time to see it move. But it will move. If you come back a thousand years later, it clearly will have grown. It's going to change. Anything that does not move cannot be alive. Because movement is a characteristic of life. And so the analogy that I've used is, if you have a horse, and it's been laying on its side in a field for two weeks, and it hasn't moved, what does that mean? It's dead. You better put dirt on it, because it's dead. The same thing is true with faith. If your faith has no evidence of life by movement, if you can't see anything moving or changing because of your faith, then it's dead. You better put dirt over it. That's what James is saying. If your faith is alive, it will move. It will be evident that it is alive because it will affect how you act. Not that your actions save you, but your faith, 
which does lead to your salvation, will be demonstrated in your life. Okay? One, one thing I've done, I don't know how many times I, if I was speaking or teaching, I just would be talking along and all of a sudden just say, I've got a penny in my pocket and anybody comes up and takes a penny, I'll give them a dollar when they're done. And then just stop and wait. And usually it takes about 10 or 15 seconds and somebody suddenly, oh, and they get up and they walk up and they, I give them the penny and I say, I'll give you the dollar when I'm done. And then I do. But Which is a demonstration of faith, right? Right. It's a, it's a demonstration. Yeah, because I don't show them the dollar. They have to trust that I have it. But by doing that, you set, you know, it becomes crystal clear of what's faith and what's not. Right. Okay, so what are we to do with our faith? Receive it, hold on to it, be sure of it, practice it. The fourth point is be prepared to explain and defend it. This is one where people really fall down. We simply don't we're either not confident enough or we have not studied enough, we haven't taken it seriously enough, to be able to explain to people what it is we believe. And we actually are ordered to do so. 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. Always, Peter says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you, not just anyone, everyone who asks you, the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. People often leave off that part of verse 16. We don't smack people upside of the head with a rolled up New Testament, you know, hold, them, hold their head under water until they agree to believe what we believe. No. We do it with gentleness and respect. But we have to be ready to give an explanation for the hope that is in us. Meaning, they ought to be able to see that there's something different about us and we ought to be able to tell them why that is. What it is about us that's different. We ought to be able to explain and defend our faith. The formal word for this is apologetics. There's actually two words for it. Um, apologetics is the positive one, um, where, where we need to be prepared to say, here is why we believe what we believe, in response to what the world says. Now, this is not, as verse 16 tells you, this is not an angry thing. And apologetics, by the way, doesn't mean to apologize. It means to explain. Um, it's not an angry thing. It simply means we have to know enough about what others say and believe to be prepared to respond with the Christian worldview. Do you know enough about your Christian worldview and how it differs from other worldviews and other ideas and other belief systems that you're able to do that? It's never a matter of, again, beating somebody up about it. And that really brings us to the next one, because uh, there's an extent to which we need to be prepared to explain our faith and defend it. But then we also need to be willing to share our faith with, us, with others, which is like the next step. Matthew 28, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given me. And again, here's a command. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now these two things clearly, be prepared to explain and defend it and share it with others. Those are related. But to me... You need to, your, the first part of that, number four, is you need to be comfortable and confident yourself as to what you believe, that you can explain it. And then you need to be prepared to be active in going out there. Now, this is evangelism. This is telling others the truth of Jesus Christ. The biggest single mistake people make, and the thing that is never, in my experience, effective, I shouldn't, in my experience, I should say it's never effective, is people think evangelism means, here's what's wrong with you. Here's how you need to change. You know, you have to accept Jesus. You're going to go to hell if you don't accept Jesus. I don't mean to be picking on you, sir. Um, that's wrong. That's not how it's done. The way that it's done, the way number five is done, is by being comfortable with number four and being able to say, let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. Let me tell you why I believe this is true. Let me, let me make it clear to you what God has taught me through my belief in Jesus Christ and how it's changed my life. Do you hear the difference in those things? That's what the right kind of sharing is. And the only way we can do that is if we really focus on ourselves understanding what our faith is and, and work through how we explain it and how we defend it too. Not in an aggressive way, but in a gentle and respectful way, as Peter said. But then we come to the place where we share it. 
in evangelism. Now, stewardship of faith and what that means. Something very close to faith, linked to it, as I say, maybe just the flip side of it, but, but related, is the issue of commitment. So I want to talk for a little bit here about the stewardship of commitment. First, what do we mean by commitment? A good definition, I think, is the determination. And, and when I, I read this definition somewhere, you notice I've got it in quotes. And they said the decision, and I didn't like that. It's not the decision, it's the determination. Because a decision can change. Determination, by definition, means it's something that's ongoing. The determination to do what needs to be done, whatever the cost. So, what needs to be done? Commitment is to, a group, to be determined to do that whatever the cost. In a Christian sense, it means doing whatever it takes for Jesus, according to God's will. That doesn't mean, you know, well, um, Jesus wants us all to believe in him, and the way I'm going to deal with that is by killing everybody who doesn't. No, that's not God's will. Um, but the way we need to understand this first, I think, is to see that God modeled exactly that kind of commitment. The determination to do what needed to be done, whatever the cost, as reflected in John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he saw the need in the world, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God saw the need, he knew what needed to be done, and both God the Father in sending Jesus and God the Son in being obedient to that, demonstrated true commitment. True commitment to us in that regard. Their determination to do what needed to be done, whatever the cost. Charles Spurgeon has a great quote about Jesus. He says, You never hear Jesus say in Pilate's judgment, Paul, one word that would let you imagine that he was sorry that he had undertaken so costly a sacrifice for us. In other words, no wavering of commitment. When his hands were, are pierced, when he is parched with fever, his tongue dried up like a shard of pottery, when his whole body is dissolved into the dust of death, you never hear a groan or a shriek that looks like Jesus is going back on his commitment. The determination to do what needs to be done, whatever the cost. God decided to save the world. God the Father sent, God the Son, and God the Son was prepared, committed to doing what was necessary to bring salvation to the whole world. Okay? That's what commitment means. Now, when we talk about commitment, we need to see that the, the love of Christ, our commitment to Christ, cannot mean merely a feeling or affection, but a commitment to follow him all the way and obey his commands. It's not gentle Jesus, sweet and mild, and as long as it's going my way, then this is the team I'm going to stay on. If it starts getting tough, then there's a Baha'i group, you know, meeting just down the street, and I'll, I'll try them out. Um, Luke 9, 23 says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. And John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Now the first of those, Luke 9, When Jesus said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross. We hear that, we don't even understand what that means anymore because we don't have a concept of what the cross meant. To the people in the first century, the cross was both the most horrendous means of death, so much so that you never even mentioned crucifixion or the cross in Roman, polite Roman society. Um, it was horrendous. And so when Jesus said, take up your cross, he was, he was clearly talking about being willing to suffer the worst possible agony. And also, the other part of it is to be completely rejected by all of the people that were supposed to matter. The cross was considered a curse. The Old Testament says, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. Anyone who was crucified, their family, their friends, everybody would have rejected them. So when Jesus says, if you're going to be my disciple, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross daily, every day, you need to be prepared to accept the most excruciating death and the most humiliating rejection if you're going to be my follower. Talk about commitment. But then we remember that that's what he did. And he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So when we talk about being a Christian, having love of Christ, it means following him 
all the way, and it means obeying Him in everything. That's what stewardship of commitment, Christian commitment means. Commitment to Christ means that we will go where He sends us, we will do what He tells us to do, we will say what He tells us to say. It is an absolute buy-in. To be all in for God. I talked about that last week in, in one regard. Commitment of this kind is built on, the relationship is built on and dependent upon faith. We have to have faith in God for us to have this kind of commitment. If we don't have strong faith, then this kind of commitment is going to go away pretty quick. We're going to wash out. Chapter 11 of Hebrews, this hall of faith, is full of people who demonstrate their faith by their acts of obedience and their commitment to God's will and God's call. It's a wonderful chapter. Abraham, Noah, Gideon, Samson, Samuel, David, Deborah, Barak, all sorts of people are listed there and what it was that they did to demonstrate their absolute commitment. It says in Hebrews 11 that by their faith and their commitment to God, they conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, received promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, uh, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. The power of faith expressed in real commitment gives us that kind of power. That's what the chap chapter 11 of, of Hebrews is all about. So commitment is doing what needs to be done, whatever it takes, for God. You'll stop me out of any questions, right? Okay. We can also say that commitment is the demonstration that we trust in God and rely on Him only. Commitment means, I trust you, Lord. I will do what you tell me to do. I'm not, I'm not in halfway. I'm not going to question it. I will do what I'm told to do. Now, it's hard sometimes for us to know exactly what he wants us to do. That's why we need to grow closer to him. Because the closer we get, the more clearly we will hear him. And that's why we need to study God's word. Because we have in written, the written word of God clear instructions. And the vast majority of times, if we're wondering what God's will is, is if we look at scripture, it will give us a pretty clear indication of these sorts of things that are in God's will and not. And direction will be available to us. But when we are committed, it means we trust him. A. Arthur, who wrote, um, she does the, the Bible study books that we, uh, she had the, the Bible study text that we used in How to Study the Bible, one of them, um, Inductive Bible Study. Uh, she precepts ministries as her organization, and they focus on teaching people Inductive Bible Study. K. Arthur says, if you do not plan to live the Christian life totally committed to knowing your God and to walking in obedience to Him, then don't begin. For this is what Christianity is all about. It is a change of citizenship, a change of governments, a change of allegiance. If you have no intention of letting Christ rule your life, then forget Christianity. It is not for you. Yes. I don't disagree with all of that. Okay, why? Because as a Christian, if you become a Christian, you now learn how to do all these things. It, it To me... When I said I was a Christian, I wasn't a Christian. But then I developed into and became more and more understanding and more responsible. To this day of me taking theology classes, which I would never have thought of, in my wildest dream. But if you look back, my whole thing has been growth, 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 growth. Right. Had I not taken that first step, um, and now, I was I was committed, but I didn't understand what I was committed to. Okay, let me ask you a question. At what point in that process that you've gone through, do you looking back now, do you think that you really were a Christian? Were you when you just it was just what you called yourself when you just a name only, or which is what when people talk about a nominal Christian, nominal means in name only. I'm still growing. I oh, don't yeah. even know. We're also when growing. you when you say that, it's like. I don't have that point of sitting in a sidecar. I do know, I do understand Jesus died for me. I do, but I also have so much insecurity as to me being a good Christian and, okay. and trying to more or less keep the walk. Okay, that there's I 
I know of a Christian, but as to saying, what, do I have enough confidence that I go out there and try to convert friends? No. Do I have enough? I, I, I'm barely, I mean, I am taking such little steps towards God. Right. Because I'm but you're, so But you're committed to doing that, and that's yes. what she's saying. But, but here's the thing. If I got somebody, anyone, that would just have a little window of opportunity to understand that they will get more and more and more, because most people think that this is a, a change that suddenly, uh, they don't even know you. Who in the hell are you? What happened? What, right. you know? Right. Suddenly you're like Mooney, you know, and you're wearing uh, funny clothes or something. You know, in other words, everybody thinks that there's going to be this tremendous change in you, that they won't even know you or like you anymore. This thing is so, to me, is so empowering of changing you and the Holy Spirit right. talking to you gently getting me to you to understand so that you can become a better person. Right. That if I thought for a minute that um, I had to suddenly walk, talk, and, and no intentions of this, and blah, 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 and that I had to be no more sinning, and I I would be like, you okay. the beginning. Now let me interrupt you. That's not what she's saying. Oh. What she is saying is not inconsistent with what you're saying. She's saying... If somebody comes to the point where they've not been a Christian and they are considering making a profession of faith, it's not okay to say, well, I'm going to become a Christian, but I still intend to do all the things I did before because I like them. I'm going to only accept Christianity as long as I like it, as long as I'm comfortable with it. I'm, you know, I'll accept Jesus over these parts of my life, but these parts of my life you better leave alone because this is mine. Now. She's talking about someone who comes into it saying, I'm going to become a Christian partially. She's not talking about somebody who is, is in the process, I'll get to you, is in the process of learning and developing and growing. Kay Arthur, she teaches inductive Bible study for the various purpose of people doing that. Okay, that's the whole focus of her ministry is to grow in the faith. But what she's saying, and the reason she's saying it is because this is very much the way our Western society, people say, well, yes, I'm a Christian. I don't believe Jesus was the Son of God, and I don't think he had follow the rules, and I think other religions are just as valid, and this and that and something else, that's not Christianity. That's not following Jesus. So that's what she's saying, is that if you don't have sufficient commitment to God and to Jesus as you enter into it initially, to say that I'm going to trust God, I'm going to rely on Him, I'm going to believe what Scripture says, I'm going to allow God control of my whole life, yeah, I'm not going to be perfect. I'm going to struggle. I mean, I'm right there with you. I still struggle in my walk and my, my discipleship and everything else. Um, so what you're saying is not inconsistent with what she's saying. She's not saying, if you haven't arrived yet, my, my oldest brother used to say, well, if you can't make the team, don't go out. You know, going out and try it for the team. That's how I feel she's saying. It. That's, not, I, that's not what she's saying. She's yeah. saying you need to understand that Christianity is a, is, really is a full commitment. This, this class is about whole life stewardship, that it affects everything you think, everything you decide, everything you do. Christianity is an all-encompassing belief system. It involves a worldview. Everything I think, everything I believe, everything I profess has to be affected by this. Right? I can't say, well, yes, I'm going to accept Jesus, but I'm still going to cheat on my taxes. I can't intentionally, consciously say, I'm just going to reject him in certain areas. That's what she's saying. Doesn't mean you fully arrived, doesn't mean you're still not maturing. It just means you better know that this is this really is a commitment. That's what she's saying. Gene, you had your hand up first? Well, yeah, but the, you kind of, she, what she said, kind of, yeah, I was thinking of Peter, and, and the fact that, you know, Jesus says, put down your nets and follow me. Did, did Peter at that moment know that three years later he would be giving the the uh, Pentecost sermon? Was he able to give the Pentecost sermon? Yeah. You know, I, like she said, I think there's a period of growth and maybe maybe what Kay is saying is the first day you commit to grow. And so then the period of growth comes after that. Well, and I think what she's saying, like using Peter as an example, she would, Peter couldn't Accept Jesus, and he said, "Well, I'll accept you, Jesus, but if it gets too much pressure, I'll just tell you right now, I'm going to reject you." Yeah. Would that have been acceptable? That doesn't mean 
that Peter didn't reach a point where he rejected Jesus and then later had to be forgiven of that and brought back into the fold. Doesn't mean we don't stumble. Doesn't mean that we're saying, I'm never going to make a mistake. But if you go into it saying, at some point, just let me let you know, I'm probably not going to want to do this anymore. That's not Christianity. That's not faith in Jesus. Um, and particularly, I'll give you a, I'll give you a parallel example, which, which might make sense to you. Um, when, he, when she says, it is a change of citizenship, a change of governments, a change of allegiance. I had some heartburn expressed in Bible study this past week. Because in Philippians, when Paul says, you know, he's talking about the, the Judaizers, that they're proud of their Jewishness and all that. He said, you want to be proud of your, of your other alliances? Well, I've got reason to be proud. I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees, circumcised on the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he says, all of my other affiliations give me great credit. And then what does he say? And I count it all garbage for the sake of Jesus Christ. He says, Jesus is the only thing that matters. None of the rest of that, not my being Jewish or circumcised or a Pharisee or anything else matters. The only thing that matters is Jesus. Now, Paul wasn't perfect either. Okay? The thing that got me in trouble is I said, I will never be the pastor of a church that has an American flag or a Canadian flag or a Mexican flag or any other national flag in it because we are not here as a citizen of some other country. We are here to worship God. You're citizens of the kingdom of Christ. And when, I thought of that when I read it, change of citizenship, change of governments, change of allegiance. Well, some people didn't like that. And they got it wrong. If they think they're there because they're American Christians or Canadian Christians or Mexican Christians or blue-eyed Christians or anything else, then they have the priorities wrong. Because Jesus trumps everything and that's the only focus. Um, a very practical additional example of that. Are you familiar with the Metropolitan Community Churches? It is a network of churches for homosexual people. That's their whole focus, is that they are a church for gay and lesbian, um, bi and transgender people. Now, whatever else, the problem I have with that, the biggest problem I have with that is, if you are a Christian or a Christian church and anything else built into your purpose, you got it wrong. You know, you can't, you can't be a church just for bricklayers. There's actually a cowboy church. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, no. There's a cowboy church. It's a denomination. They do let other people go, though. Okay? They recognize that it was sort of an outreach to the cowboys didn't have, you know, my brother's cowboy. So, literally, I mean, riding wild bulls kind of stuff. But, but there's an inherent problem when we, when we are a Christian and, when we're a follower of Jesus and, and we make that one thing. That doesn't mean that we can't be a follower of Jesus, who also is a bricklayer. I'm not saying that. You get the difference? But if I'm a bricklaying follower of Jesus, then I, I wrap all that together and then I have a problem. And that's about what I was going to say. You still could be a Christian who is an American citizen or yeah. a Christian who is a Canadian citizen. Right, absolutely. In fact, you should be. And you yeah. should be a good, patriotic citizen yeah. in your country. Yeah. But we don't come to this place in order to recognize your Americanism. We come here to focus on being Christ. And I, you were there, I think. I told the yeah. example that when I was with World Vision, I had a friend from Africa who was visiting and went to church with me on Sunday and happened to be, I don't remember if it was the 4th of July or Memorial Day or Veterans Day or something. But they marched in with the American flag and they sang... Uh, you know, a patriotic song and everything else. And at the end of the service, um, you know, they had all the veterans stand up, and at the end of the service, my African friend said, well, clearly this service wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. Well, we should never do anything that, convinced that, that indicates to people that this isn't for them if they are a follower of Jesus. I skipped you a second ago, Ken, go ahead. Well, um, um, well a perfect example of what you're talking about there would be Gandhi, when he said, I love the teachings of Jesus. And I like Jesus. I just can't become a Christian because of Christians. Yeah. And it's it was bad, you know refusing to see God for who He is, regardless of the, the weakness and the frailty of humanity. And a scripture verse, Psalm thirty-five. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Not most things, half the things, the comfortable things, the easy things. Everything. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust Him to help you do it, and He will. One of the reasons
reasons that a lot of people don't find satisfaction in the Christian faith, the reason that they don't, you know, they don't, it never really clicks, it never really works for them, is because they haven't really given it a shot. They have not had a full commitment to it. G.K. Chesterton said that Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and not tried. Well, I would add to that that a lot of people have gone halfway and then been dissatisfied with it. We're not fully committed. That doesn't, saying that we're fully committed does not mean we, are, we have fully arrived. Because we haven't. We will not be until... You know, the Lord comes back and we go through glorification, we, we enter heaven with Him. We all are in the process. But the question is, are you giving it all you've got in the process? Or are you, and this is what K. Arthur's talking about, are you only going halfway? Are you only willing to say, okay, you can have this part, but not this part? You all, um, did you ever see the book by Bob Munger? It's a little booklet, actually, called My Heart, Christ's Home. It's a wonderful little book. I knew Bob Munger. Um, my, my seminary days. He and his wife were great. They would have college students come and live with them um, and disciple them that way. You know, it's like their basement, they had bunk beds everywhere. Um, that book, what he does is he goes through each room of a hypothetical house and he talks about the way in which Jesus needs and desires to, wishes to inhabit that room as though that house were your life, your heart. Um, and those different rooms represent, you know, the different rooms in this house, which is your heart, represent different aspects of your life that Jesus wants to completely fill. And he talks about the fact that you can't have one, you know, your den, you don't let Jesus in there. You can't have a closet that, that, that you have forbidden Jesus to come in and shine his light into. That's, and that's what K. Arthur is saying. This is an all or nothing thing when you make a commitment. That doesn't mean you have to have it all together. It just means you have to be willing to commit it all. And then, that's how we grow. That's how God makes it right for us. And failing to do that is really a formula for failure in the Christian life. And this is why I say that this is stewardship, that we need to be willing to commit ourselves to that. Yes? What's TLB? Oh, uh, TLB. It's the Living Bible translation. Um, yeah. It's just a particular translation. I, I usually use the NIV, but uh, when I don't, I'll let you know. Um, and that's a particular translation. Um, I like the way that. In fact, I was using a reference book that had that TLB, and so I looked at several others, and I agreed that that was the best, best way to understand it. Okay, I want to give you now four particular ways that we need to be prepared to be stewards of our commitments. Okay, stewardship of commitment. The first one is, most obviously, what we've just been talking about, commitment to Christ. Paul said in Philippians, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Right? This is prior to the part I was just talking about Philippians where he says, I've got all these Jewish credentials and they're garbage compared to my life in Christ, compared to, to him and my commitment to him. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To live is Christ means everything. Everything about my life is about him. Okay? When he says to die is gain, Paul talks about the fact that uh, he was in prison when he wrote Philippians. And he thought he might, be, he might die then. We don't believe he did. We believe he was released and then later rearrested and executed in Rome. But the idea is he actually goes through the process writing and he says, you know, on the one hand, I know that for all the suffering I've had to go through, if I were to die, I'd be in the presence of Jesus. And that's really attractive to me. But on the other hand, if I stay alive, then I can still help you and help others come to know Jesus and grow in their faith. And it's a really hard choice for me. To me, for me to live, whatever I do is Christ. To die is would be gain. Okay. The most important commitment that we can make is the commitment to serve Christ faithfully, to be committed to Him. And I want to read you. Um, I mentioned to you this book, The Stewardship of Life. Uh, there's a story in here about Franklin Graham and Samaritan's Purse. And Franklin Graham went to the Sudan. In the Sudan, they had been a, there's a long history of civil war between the Muslim peoples of the north who run the government and the Christian people in southern Sudan who have no, no power, no official authority. Um, and it's been, it's been horrible for many years. There have been refugee camps in the Sudan for a couple generations now. 
Well, Franklin Graham, they had some ministry work over there from Samaritan's Purse, and they had a hospital. And that hospital, they had um, tried to bomb it four times. And each time they missed hitting the hospital, but they hit the buildings around it, and a number of people were killed. So Franklin Graham went to the Sudan and met with the president, who's the one who was ordering this stuff to be done. And, and he challenged him. And in, in a pretty blunt way, you know, the, the president apparently said to him, well, you know, I think you should become a Muslim. And Frank McGram said, and I think you should become a Christian. And if you'll let me, I'll tell you why. And then Frank McGram said, and in fact, I want to tell everyone in your country why they should become a Christian and let them choose. And are you afraid of that? And it, it was very tense, you know, and all, all the people who were behind, like behind the president of the Sudan thought, man, nobody talks to him like that. And some people thought Frank McGram wasn't going to get out of the country alive. Well, he went back to the hotel in Khartoum, and the next morning there was a message saying, the president of Sudan has said you can preach anywhere in the country you want to, but he wasn't responsible for the consequences. Well, there was a church in Khartoum, and the man, uh, Pastor Sammy Dagar, who was his translator, who was from Lebanon, had been there and had been translating for him. Um, because that's what they said, this Pastor Dagar went to speak at a church in Khartoum, a Christian church. And they, the people there had been persecuted. And the story that's told in this book is that prior to the meeting, um, Pastor Dagar meets with the pastor of this church and says, well, don't you have Muslim informers here who will know if I'm preaching? And, and won't you have to suffer the consequences? Even, you know, because he said, I'm not responsible for what happens. But you, you know, I'm not going to stop you from preaching. But I'm not responsible for what happens, meaning if people uh, take violent action, don't blame me. Well, when he asked the pastor, won't there be Muslim informers and won't you pay the consequences, the response was from that pastor, oh yes, the informers are every Sunday, but you go ahead and you preach the gospel. They've already killed so many of us, let them kill some more. What difference does it make? You preach the gospel. That's commitment to the gospel. Now, the guy was not being frivolous with the lives of his followers. I mean, he probably would have been the primary target. But the point is, the commitment to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ in that situation and around the world is so great that people will die in order to be able to keep telling the truth of the grace and mercy and salvation that is found in Jesus Christ. There are more Christians persecuted today than all of the Christians that have been persecuted in history. In most parts of the world, persecution is the way of life for Christians. Right now, the story, and I got an email about this this morning from somebody whose ministry is working in northern Syria, that ISIS is, they're killing Christian children to make a point. And so they've asked for prayer about that. That's the thing that's in the news right now, but the same kind of thing is happening all over the world. We must be prepared to be committed to Christ as Paul was, to live as Christ, to die as gain. I will not give up my commitment to him, my testimony of Christ, even if I die. We are prepared to give up our testimony in Christ if it becomes inconvenient. If somebody in the church says something to us we don't like, how will we deal with it if we become the target of persecution? All right? We should be willing to say even the threat of death will not turn us away from our commitment. Second, we have to have a commitment to people. John 13, a new commandment, Jesus says, I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you're my disciples if you love one another. The mark of the Christian is supposed to be the relationship people see, especially between brothers and sisters, but also between those who are followers of Jesus and the people who are not part of the faith. Not in judgment and condemnation and all of that, but in compassion and an acceptance, and in love. People say, well, you, people, the secular critics will say, well, you know, believing in Christianity is the only right religion, and evangelizing is, is not only impolite, but it's, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's an oppression, that you're oppressing people when you evangelize. If I believe that Jesus Christ truly is the Son of God, and He came and died for us, and <clears throat> believing in Him is the root to eternal life, then sharing that with people is the most generous and kind thing I will ever be able to do. 
I don't care who tells me that it's an oppressive thing. Now, yeah, if I try to force them to do it, that would be oppressive. And we don't do that. We do it with gentleness and respect. Remember First Peter? So, we need to be committed to people. Third, we need to be committed to prayer. Paul in 1 Thessalonians says, Rejoice always, pray continually. King James says, Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. There is no more powerful tool, no more powerful force that we can access than prayer. This miraculous, mysterious thing of relationship that we have with the God of the whole universe. The fact that we have access to the one true creator, redeemer God, and that we can talk with him, and that we can listen to him. If we really had a concept of what that means in terms of the power, and I mean power in a positive sense, not for me, but the, the ability to affect good in the world, if we really had a sense of that and understood it, then how could we go for days at a time and never bother to look up in prayer to the Lord? We need to have a commitment to pray, to pray continually, to pray short bullet prayers, you know, just those shoot them up prayers, you know, about something that we see. Um, the, and I, I try to have a habit when I see people who, on the streets, walking in the stores, uh, and even animals, <laughs> they clearly there's some there's a need. Well, I do this a lot when I'm visiting San Francisco because there are more broken people in the streets of San Francisco than anywhere else I've ever been, and I'm including it. When I say broken, mentally ill, physically ill, and I'm including in that being in Ethiopia and places of that sort. There is more obvious, bro obvious brokenness in some American cities than I have seen in the worst situations I've visited in humanitarian efforts around the world. And so I find myself just saying, if it's nothing more than, Lord God, bless that person. Let them experience your mercy and your grace and bring them to you. If it's just that. But then also be much more intentional and much more comprehensive in your prayer for the needs that exist. And there is extraordinary power and grace for you personally, and for the things in your life. So commitment to prayer. To Christ, to people, to prayer. And finally, commitment to principles. Commitment means, remember we talked about faith, should affect your life. It needs to be an active influence in your life. Well, that gets manifested in terms of how you make commitment to certain things. Philippians 4. Philippians has a lot to say about this. I've quoted so often. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things, such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. We have to have a commitment to the principles of the Christian faith, to grace and mercy, compassion, generosity, faithfulness, loyalty, honor, the principles that are the principles that reflect the graciousness of God and that He allows us to experience in our own life. We have to be committed to those things. Which means committed in those things in small ways as well as big ways. I do not pay Mordita. If I get stopped and they say they're going to give me a ticket, I'll accept the ticket and say, you know, okay, they threaten to impound my car. I go, well, I wish you would do that, but okay. I'll have to deal with it later. So far, they've never impounded my car. But I don't pay a bribe if I know I haven't done anything wrong. I'll pay the fine, whether I think I deserve it or not, but I won't pay a bribe. Now, I'm not saying everybody who's ever done that is, you know, is damned to hell forever or anything like that, but I think we have to understand that we don't draw lines and say this level of dishonesty or of cruelty, or of uh, greed, or maliciousness, or whatever, that that's acceptable. You can go that far. No, those who are faithful in small things will be faithful in large things, Scripture says. You know, we've run into that as a church, because from time to time, um, you know, we had a, an accountant who told us the thing we needed to do in order to not have the government give us any trouble was lie about receipts. Make up receipts. And we went, no, we're not going to do that. We'll deal with the consequences, but we are not going to lie. We're not going to falsify documents. And, and the person who did this, um, who was helping us with this, was a pastor. And this pastor is a, because, and I'm sure it's based on experience, real experience. He feels as though the government 
in one way or another, to some extent or another, is sort of the enemy of the church. And so therefore we, whatever we have to do to get things done that need to get done, even if it means lying to the government, then that's okay. And we go, no, it's not okay. Obey the civil authorities, the scripture says. And God has blessed us in that, and I think we will continue to. And if we have to pay consequences for that, then we will pay the consequences for that. But we will be faithful to the principles that are consistent with what Jesus teaches us. And that's honesty, and again, loyalty, honor, devotion, generosity, compassion. Doesn't mean we always get it right. Doesn't mean we don't flare up in anger about things too. Certainly I do. Doesn't mean we're perfect, but we are committed to those principles. When I do something like that, nobody is more upset with me than I am for having broken that. I haven't arrived, I'm not perfect, but I know what I believe because I know who I believe. Committed the principles that are consistent with the faith. So, stewardship of commitment to Christ, to people, to prayer, to principles. Questions about that? Does that ring true with you? Yeah. <laughs> Again, don't think that I or K. Arthur or anybody else I've quoted is suggesting that we have to be to arrive fully blown point is, do we understand that God calls us to a full commitment? And that we need to, if we haven't arrived, we need to be working for that. When Jesus said, be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect, he didn't actually expect that we were going to become perfect. But he meant we have to be committed to becoming as perfect as we can because of our commitment to God. And that's what he calls us to. If we don't commit ourselves to trying to be perfect, we're going to get a lot further away from being perfect than if we don't believe that we're going to try. Any questions? Alrighty then. We will see you all tomorrow if you're in the other class and next week, if, uh, not next week, two weeks from now. Two weeks from now. Well, I wouldn't be here if you showed up. Two weeks from now for the rest of the class.